Hello, friends. Uh, welcome to Be Waste Wise. We are almost at the end of 2019, and we've had some great panels here at uh, Be Waste Wise. And uh, with Robert, especially, we've had uh, three other panels with him, all of which have been significantly diverse. And today is the fourth panel that uh, Robert Crocker is uh, going to uh, moderate for us. So, uh, all right, so let me just get started. If you haven't seen the other panels that Robert or the others have moderated for us, please go to our website, go to the video panel section. You will find a list of them there. I am going to get started now. Today, we are going to talk about the future of waste picking. I'm personally very interested in knowing more about this topic, so I'm quite excited about this panel. And uh, Robert Crocker, who many of you may have seen in our panels in the past, is the moderator. He is the Deputy Director of the China Australia Center for Sustainable Urban Development. And we have Cecilia, who's from Sao Paulo. She is a philosopher and a full professor of design in the College of Architecture and Urbanism at the University of Sao Paulo. We were supposed to have John Devlin join us, but uh, he couldn't make it. There was something else that he had to, uh, th there was something else that he was caught up with and he could not make it, but I'm sure this conversation will be super interesting. So uh, please, uh, since you're watching it live, please uh, feel free to use the chat, feel free to use the Q&A. Robert will ensure that your questions are answered as part of this panel. So I'm just gonna hand this over to Robert right now. So over to you, Robert. Well, thank you very much, Seth. Um, can everyone hear me now? Yep, okay. Um, yeah, uh, I think, um, Waste picking, you know, is very, very ancient. That's the first thing we should say, that um, all societies uh, that have lived in cities since uh, ancient times have had waste pickers. The, um, what makes our time very interesting is that uh, there are now more and more cities, they're bigger and bigger, there's more and more waste. Uh, in developing cities where you, you know, in my lifetime, for example, I think Delhi has grown 10 times just in my lifetime in size. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the, the very rapid growth in cities, particularly in the developing world, means that waste pickers play a, a very, very important role in collecting waste. Um, it's very, very hard to understand, uh, you know, exactly um, how many there are. Um, I've seen estimates from uh, six, uh, 60 million to 200 million around the world. And this is because people don't become waste pickers as a career usually. Sometimes they, they, um, uh, they will take it up for a while. Uh, they will then uh, jump out of it or do something else. Um, very rarely are they waste pickers for life. And uh, sometimes their lives are very, very hard, you know, in, in those circumstances. There are people who are waste pickers for life, but for, for, for many, it tends to be something seasonal. But um, in so many cities now in the developing world, only 50%, perhaps 80% uh, of waste is actually formally collected. So we rely on them a lot in collecting waste and, uh, and sorting it. Um, a lot of waste pickers, for example, can uh, tell around uh, or identify around 30 um, recyclable products or objects. Um, and in the, the developed world, there are more and more people who uh, pick waste simply because they are poor, they are homeless, they have no work. And this in a way is a return to what has been a universal, if you like, uh, occupation going back many, many centuries. So my guest tonight, um, Cecilia, uh, is somebody who's had a long and interesting relationship uh, with waste and with the problems associated with waste from a design perspective, from a philosophical perspective, from a political perspective. And I'm very, very pleased to, um, to, to, first of all, to ask her, to welcome her and to ask her what um, 
why did she become interested in waste pickers or how did she become interested in them and 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 uh, perhaps she could perhaps describe her um, relationship to this topic through her research through her work in design thank you hi uh, Sveta can you hear me yes yes we can <coughs> So hi Sveta, how Rob and how everyone. It's a pleasure being here together with uh, Sveta and, uh, and Rob and the audience following us. Thank you for your time and interest. Uh, I agree absolutely with Robert. Uh, uh, there is a historical ingredient when we talk about, uh, about waste. Uh, but of course, we are in a very interesting uh, point uh, in time in uh, human history uh, with the extraordinary growth of waste and waste pickers, uh, as well uh, what I used to call the growth of cities of plastic and cardboard across the world. Uh, so uh, I start uh, working uh, on waste from the perspective of homeless communities, homeless encampments uh, in three cities, Sao Paulo, uh, Los Angeles, and Tokyo. And uh, uh, I was really uh, looking at uh, waste as a means and uh, adaptive uh, repertoire and uh, strategy of subsistence uh, for the private people, for homeless people in these three cities. Uh, so the reuse of material is a condition of adapting to uh, the poor life, to the precarious life situation that homeless confront in their daily life. And, and then I start uh, paying attention to the kind of materials that they mainly rescue and reuse in order to protect uh, their body, uh, how, how, they, how they manage and also how they, uh, if we could say, uh, design and build uh, the city of plastic and cardboard. That was, that was uh, why and uh, the circumstance that uh, I started looking at waste. Uh, uh, we, could, uh, we could say, uh, and I used to say, it is about spontaneous design that uh, these marginal spaces created by homeless uh, provide uh, a very, very contemporary point of view to think about urban space and to think about uh, metropolis across the world. Uh, with great capacity of improvisation, uh, homeless people uh, they, they reuse and they create uh, what I call, uh, using an expression from uh, the great anthropologist Lévi-Strauss, French anthropologist, uh, I talk about the concept of bricolage. That's what these homeless people, they, 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 they could be considered as bricoleurs according to the concept of uh, uh, Levi-Strauss. Uh, of course, Levi-Strauss is not talking directly about homelessness, but uh, uh, the making process of these makeshift habitats, uh, we could apply this idea of uh, bricolage, and we could think about urban bricolage uh, from uh, the perspective of uh, the daily life of homeless people. Sorry. <laughs> uh, 
Cecilia, um, uh, homelessness and um, design are very interesting uh, um, subjects to bring together in this way. <laughs> we, don't, we don't think of uh, um, the homeless as designers. And yet, in a way, survival requires us, uh, you know, we, we are all to a great extent designers, the way we shape our homes, our gardens, our, our lives, um, you know, the, the, the choices we make. Um, but I guess uh, one, of the, one of the questions that comes up when, when we look at waste picking is that we, we now live in a world drowning in materials. You know, you mentioned plastics, cardboards. Um, you know, we, uh, while, while most of the essential things we need, we still waste a lot of things because waste in a sense is what we leave behind, but we're leaving, we're more mobile, we have more stuff, it's cheaper, it's more accessible, and, um, uh, you know, and as its, its costs go down, we don't value it, so then we throw it away. And, and these people perform a, an essential social and economic service, in my understanding, because... Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll let you talk about that, the role of uh, waste picking in the world of consumption and waste, or overconsumption and overwaste. Yeah. <laughs> so, Rob, uh, I think, you know, these people, uh, they, they brought our attention to the issue. Uh, I could show just one image. Uh, I don't know if it's, it's good here from here, but what you can see, it's a, 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 a catador, a, a waste picker, just driving uh, his uh, wagon uh, across the city of Sao Paulo. So according to me, uh, these catadores in the past, when they used this uh, wooden wagon in order to collect material, uh, when they navigate the city, they are at the same time uh, making their manifesto and showing to ourselves uh, that that trash, I mean that it's not trash because they don't like that we say that is trash. But that, that trash, according to us, and that, uh, let's say, uh, uh, is extremely important resource for them, you know, uh, is what connect uh, us to. And it's a kind of a manifesto that until now here uh, we see, because right now they replace this uh, wooden wagon for uh, very old and uh, out of market cars. Uh, it's so funny. We have certain old uh, models or old car models that they are driving and they are adapting certain structures material that they, they, they collect from the streets in order to uh, rescue and collect more material. So uh, no more wooden vegans, uh, maybe one or two here and there, but not as it was in the past. This image that I just showed is from the 90s. So today the situation is a little bit different, but uh, from from uh, the, the first approach, we could say that uh, collectors, catadores, they, they give us the opportunity to be aware of the amount of material that we turn away uh, in a daily basis, uh, almost as a ritual, you know, every day we discard and these collectors are there rescuing, uh, you know, before the, the uh, municipal uh, collection. Let's, so it's very, it's very important. It's very sad, I, I must say, you know, it's very sad. It touches us a lot to see this situation. 
especially when it goes to homelessness because uh, there, there are other ingredients in the relation between homelessness and uh, waste. Um, Cecilia, uh, if we turned this conversation around and we said, let's talk about the circular economy, if we were going to look at this from the perspective of the circular economy, we would say, well, those materials that they are picking up uh, really have value. It's just that we can't see that value. And, uh, and because we can't see that value, we can't see, and this is a proposal that I'm suggesting to you, we can't see the value of their work. Because we don't see the value in our trash, and you've alluded to this, we don't see uh, the value of their work in rescuing, in, in, in reusing and recycling that material uh, because we're drowning in it and uh, this is causing climate change ultimately. I think recent research I've read said that 60% of greenhouse gas emissions is from household consumption and uh, you know slowing down this cycle of continuous uh, consumption and wasting of, of discard is very, very important. So I'd just like your thoughts on, on this, this issue of value and materials. Oh, so uh, Rob, uh, I think as an educator, for me, uh, that's absolutely imperative to work uh, considering uh, the, the, the circular economy and uh, also uh, to work considering the United Nations uh, goals uh, for sustainable development. And uh, since 2003, uh, just trying to, uh, to uh, stimulate, to push uh, students from architecture school, architecture and urbanism college at the University of Sao Paulo, I created an elective discipline uh, designed for sustainability just to motivate my students. It is an elective discipline, but uh, every year it's full. <laughs> it's full. It's many, many students from the school and also international schools, uh, international students uh, come to this discipline. I think the, the main question, uh, Rob, I, I am very honest to say, uh, is it possible to design a space in cities for a inclusive circular economy? That's the point, because we, we don't give value to their work. We don't give value to their waste. And as well as we don't give value to their lives, and that's the point, you know, and how to combine and how to, uh, you know, uh, how to educate urbanists uh, and designers and architects to face that problem. It's, it's very challenging, Rob, you know. Uh, uh, I know that these guys, when I, I bring students to their place, uh, because I, I have some, uh, some uh, you know, classes that students go there to their, to their side and uh, they, they take, my students take a huge benefit uh, from the knowledge, the kind of knowledge that they have about materials. Uh, the flotation of prices in the market, for example, is something that we society we are not aware uh, the perception of waste is something that uh, they 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 know very well and, and also they know our routine when at what time precisely we are gonna put our waste on the street so they know that and they have a special logistic you know to go there before the municipal collection to get the material. It's very interesting because in our last conversation with uh, a very different one with Duncan Baker Brown, uh, the architect, 
he made the point uh, to me that um, uh, in a way, one of the problems is once something becomes trash, it becomes very difficult to reuse because it becomes uh, contaminated. And in, in construction, you, you know, you're not allowed to use anything that's been contaminated. So, so they go to tremendous lengths, uh, these engineers, to take buildings apart so that we don't contaminate. In, in the world of uh, Catadores, though, um, contamination is part of the problem, isn't it? The fact that nothing Absolutely. is... Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. There is a sanitary uh, 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 ingredient in this conversation that uh, we have to we have to collaborate to to resolve you know uh, that's why uh, in university of sao paulo uh, we had a collaboration with other other schools not only architecture and the design school but also medicine schools you know and that's and 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 the law school and i could i could go on and, and and uh, telling about all the interdisciplinary collaboration that we have built together. But uh, what is important to mention, and uh, uh, I am a little bit lost in time because I don't recall exactly when it was, but we had a meeting uh, with uh, Catadores and uh, we, we were there, professors from business school, from from med, 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 medical school, from uh, myself, and uh, and from law school, and and uh, a, a catadora, I mean a, a woman that collects, uh, she asked, I would ask you, professor, if it would be possible to test our blood, because uh, I want to know. Uh, what kind of uh, health problems I have due to my professional uh, work. And uh, yes, and my dear colleague um, uh, from medical school, he, the Professor Nelson Gouveia, uh, he started a project to, to test the blood of catadores from uh, one specific cooperative. So it's very important, Rob, you know, to work together with engineer school. Last week, last week, as a matter of fact, I was in two very, very nice final projects committee. One is about to create a, a, a central uh, point in, at the University of Sao Paulo main campus to uh, manage our university uh, trash. And another one was about something that would be very proper to to to, to Australia. Uh, it is about it is about white white uh, white glass pack. Uh, I mean wine glass uh, package. That is that was another in a, also at the engineering school uh, another uh, uh, final project. So. Uh, it, it is very, very important to have interdisciplinary, uh, you know, approach to the issue. And of course, sanitary condition is uh, imperative uh, to us. So, so um, I guess, uh, you know, one of, one of the things you bring up occasionally in what you were saying is uh, you, you, these people are now um, collaborating, you've been collaborating with them. Um, I'm just wondering if a social innovation model, uh, a social enterprise model, or a, you know, like a living lab or a, some kind of um, social enterprise model could be used to uh, harness their creativity, their knowledge. I mean, if you, if uh, I can't tell 30 different recyclable materials by sight, um, most of them can. From my from my understanding, um, this this is knowledge which uh, presumably has value, you know, in in the real world. And yet, all around the world, there are more and more developing nations uh, trying to trying to leapfrog into what they think is uh, developed waste management, which involves high tech. 
you know, uh, incineration, waste to energy, um, you know, because that will bring in money of some kind, but often involves incredible expenses because if you're uh, already spending a very large proportion of your budget on collecting, you don't have a lot of cash for big machines. Um, and these people are already there, you know, so it becomes a really interesting, uh, you know, issue around, as one of our questioners, Asit uh, Tripathi, is, uh, you know, asking, um, you know, what, what is the kind of economic value of these, these people and their work? Um, you know, and can we calculate it? Can we actually somehow link them into the formal waste uh, economy? So, sorry, <laughs> that's a long question. No, no th thank you, thank you, Robert. I think uh, that, that's the point. That's exactly the point. What we have here in Brazil, uh, we, uh, we have, it was uh, signed, in 2010, the, 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 the policy, the national policy of solid waste. And uh, after 20 years of uh, debate in, 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 in the Congress, in the Federal Congress, uh, finally uh, in 2010, we had the law, the law, the, the, the national policy of solid waste. And uh, that, that is very, uh, very remarkable because catadores are inside the law, we can read there and they acknowledge uh, their, their role and that is very important. Of course, the implementation of the law is uh, according to uh, five uh, uh, million and, uh, uh, and uh, municipalities that are uh, involved in the process, the, the, the implementation is according to each municipality. It's difficult, but uh, step by step, it's going on. Uh, but th this shows us that uh, the problem is how to create uh, uh, possible policies uh, in order to integrate design, technology, uh, and responses to current challenges faced by waste pickers. Uh, that, that's the problem, how, how to create uh, and how to implement these, these policies. Uh, initially, it was, you know, uh, optimism around, around the law, around inclusive recycling policies, uh, empowerment of the informal sector, but all of these, you know, uh, now is not the same as it was in the past. Uh, so uh, I think, uh, despite of the, the complex operations uh, and the services delivered by, uh, I mean, public services delivered by waste picker, their, their life conditions did not, did not change the way we hoped it to change. So, and also there is a floating market for uh, the value of, of, of materials. Uh, this is a, a, a question of, of governance and uh, we have to face, uh, there is no, no, no answer, there is no, no model that we could say, let's go through this model. So, uh, circumstances and the context and the different contexts uh, in different countries and culture and uh, and uh, you know uh, uh, continents they, they change. Uh, it would be very nice to consider the experience of a tiny city uh, of Boros in Sweden. Uh, in over 20 years they change and they have a policy that we could uh, we could talk later. Hmm. Um, thank you. Uh, I, I was, uh, there's somebody um, has actually mentioned, well, on the chat, if you press your chat button, you'll see this, but um, uh, an interesting study done by uh, Scheinberg, uh, the economics of the informal sector in solid waste management. I'll chase that up. Um, and another very interesting one from Indonesia, 
there are several projects taking place uh, on waste issues, waste factory um, uh, with Gilly Eco Trust. Um, yeah, so I think I think you know all around the world. I, I was actually going to mention that um, in in Central Australia, there's um, uh, an NGO that breaks up e-waste using uh, unemployed Aboriginal people, people who've just got out of jail. You know, and so there's a lot of a lot of NGOs, a lot of um, organisations. I suppose that's why I was bringing up this this notion of um, social innovation, social enterprise, because um, sometimes governments can uh, kickstart these uh, these bodies by um, providing perhaps a little bit of funding, uh, because often these people start as volunteers and then. Um, and then they start supporting themselves and it, it becomes very interesting because you have problems like plastics you have problems like e-waste they're getting worse uh you know and and um and then there are then there are uh, materials and and products we throw away that can be re reused as they are and that becomes a very interesting issue we have a a group in melbourne which is um partly funded by the the government which um uh, takes apart um, large numbers of uh, um, e-waste and uh, you know the, the ones that can be reused they simply uh, find a home for them and a use for them and I guess you know if we, we're moving into the circular economy we'll get more and more of these interesting um, opportunities interesting developments occurring I suppose I was particularly interested in, in your experience because uh, Brazil, Colombia, uh, in South America, uh, the pickers have been more advanced in ready in their readiness to self-organize, to organize communal um, efforts to uh, to say, we are here, we are working, we don't want to be exploited, we want certain rights. You want to talk a bit more about that? Yeah. Yeah, that's that that is what is going on. Uh, you know, for, for, for a long time, uh, exactly here in Brazil, uh, a, a, a small uh, homeless community in downtown Sao Paulo uh, just to organize a party, a religious party, they, they had the idea because they, they, did, they, they, they were homeless people, all right, so no money, but yeah. of course they went to celebrate life and it was a religious party, and they decided to collect a newspaper from the sidewalk, all right, to, 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 to try to sell that material to have their party. And they did that, they did that, and they, they, they saw how effective it was for them to collect material and sell material uh, to uh, to make uh, a, a small small amount of money, they had the party, and uh, uh, a couple of of months after, they created you know a small collaboration among them. Uh, the, they were homeless people, but they have created this small cooperative. Then they. They, 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 uh, that was downtown Sao Paulo, and a couple of years later, they took uh, the under uh, of a viaduct uh, in Pinheiro's neighborhood in a very, uh, very uh, crucial point, uh, because it's a business, it's very close to business area, and there they are until now working. So they collect from that area and from uh, the, the business district here in Pinheiros, Rua Teodoro Sampaio and Cardeal Arco Verde, and they get access to all kinds of uh, materials from business area. So they started this collective movement. The, the key point is that it is collective and it is from grassroots. Uh, and uh, and, and that that collective uh, collective mind uh, is is extremely important because then uh, in two thousand and one 
they have created a movement, a, a national movement. It's called the Movimento Nacional dos Catadores de Materiais Recicláveis. It is national movement of collectors of recyclable material. And this movement, they, they start debating their rights. They started in Brasilia in 2001. I was there talking to them. And they started that and, uh, you know, claiming for their rights. And they, they built this impressive movement across Latin America because they start, you know, uh, dialoguing with Colombia, with Argentina and other, uh, other uh, countries here in, in, in Latin America. And also they start, you know, dialoguing with India and other, other countries. So the leaders of these movements frequently, they travel and they debate and they try, you know, to, to, to improve their rights to the waste. Because of course, incineration will take them out of the system. That's what I was going to ask you next is, um, there is technology now that can help us collaborate, that can build platforms, that can encourage collaboration and, and actually help us make money from waste, you know, um, and uh, there's some examples come up on the, um, the chat screen, very interesting one uh, from Naomi, um, uh, collecting waste to give one to two salaries, um, and also somebody talking about precious plastics, which is another very interesting group. I guess, um, you know, so the, the technologies can be used very positively, but sometimes the professionalization of waste and waste management can uh, direct uh, often quite precious resources into burning waste for energy. And I was wondering what you thought about that, because I know in um, uh, in some poor countries it's a problem when you don't have uh, the kind of funding to keep these things going effectively and to run them well. It can cause further problems in uh, in terms of um, pollution and um, you know and also of course it pushes the catadores the waste pickers to one side. Perhaps you have you got any experience of that or any insight into that? So the, the experience that I have is that always when uh, we are talking to catadores and when they go to my universe to talk to my students or uh, when my students go to their site, uh, the, the main point is that we don't appreciate the burning waste because then we will lose our job. That, that point is you know, every time is a routine in their talk. And, and here in Brazil, our, uh, our energy generation is uh, basically from hydro model. So, so uh, it's not the question that we need extra, extra uh, energy generation. Of course, we have also, as you have in Australia, the solar energy, it's improving. So our situation uh, to energy uh, generation is not really related to, to waste. So I think uh, uh, we need to figure out uh, different models, different models to, to uh, you know, to integrate technology, but also to keep the right to life of these people. Uh, yeah. Because th th that situation, we, as you mentioned at the beginning of your talk, we don't know how many they are. Uh, we don't know. There is no census about that. And that's the problem, you know, Rob, uh, with the, 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 the huge amount of people uh, that we have and the huge amount of waste that we have. Uh, we need to consider uh, you know, uh, waste also from uh, a humanitarian perspective. Uh, it's, it's very difficult, it's very difficult, but we have NGOs, we have charities, and uh, we have, uh, we have uh, knowledge 
that for sure we will be able to, I hope we will be able to assemble, you know, uh, yes. tools to face that challenge. I think um, uh, we have some really interesting questions uh, and some interesting comments. Um, uh, the first one I, I thought I'd just comment on is this business about the reduction of volume. Because in a way, um, the consumption and the, the waste problem are directly linked. And so uh, if we can divert waste, I mean, the first, the first, the top of the waste hierarchy is diverting waste uh, into being able to not be treated as waste, to be able to reuse waste is absolutely critical. So that's a very good uh, point. And I think certain jurisdictions, certain companies are making great progress in this area. And uh, it, it would be interesting, I know, for example, uh, some of the waste pickers that I've come across uh, through various students, they, um, people are uh, rescuing materials that are, and, and objects and products and components that are then used. They're taken out of the waste stream, they're used, we're saving the energy, the water, the materials that have gone into the making of them because they're continuing to live. Um, textiles is a particularly interesting example of this. Um, but uh, um, now, some of the other, some of the other, there's a very interesting uh, report um, mentioned as well. Um, waste incineration in informal livelihoods, a technical guide on waste to energy initiatives. That would be an interesting one. I'd, I'll have to I'll have to look at that one. Thank you very much, Varelle. Um, and uh, then there's another, um, uh, you know, the separation of organics in Bali. That's I know in Bali there's been tremendous um, advances in areas like plastics. However, you know, I have I still have some doubts about Bali because the development is out of control in my view. So, <laughs> um, so here we are. Um, I do not agree with the point that waste to energy technology is against recycling or waste pickers. Well, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be, but unfortunately there's been a few instances of this. Um, waste pickers cannot solve by themselves the problem of waste management, yeah, particularly in big cities. I think we all agree on that. Um, uh, I think waste to energy shall be another alternative to consider. Um, as part of a solution to a problem. My, my view is it's a very short-term thing because um, it's basically giving up on the, on the problem of the materials, uh, which is part of, I hope, the, um, the sector economy. Because if you're going to say, well, we've got this problem, we're not going to do anything in design terms, then uh, we may as well uh, just burn it. When, for me, a lot of the things that are being burned should probably not be made at all. And this again is a very interesting question. Uh, maybe Cecilia, you might have to say something on this. <laughs> uh, Rob, uh, I I am not, uh, you know, uh, in technology. I mean, in energy, so it's very hard for me to comment. I was just, uh, you know, voicing what collectors uh, uh, daily say to us. Uh, they 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 are so scared about that. And yeah. from uh, from from their perspective, uh, that that is not uh, you know that's not what they they want. Mm -hmm. uh, is is extremely hard. Is extremely hard to talk about this relation. Uh, I think uh, uh, you know it's very very important also to consider uh, some artistic possibility of uh, working on waste. Uh, mm. Even, even in not only in fine arts, but even in in film, we have very good examples uh, of of you know uh, narratives about ways that uh, is important to be considered. Uh, we we have a Brazilian uh, a Brazilian uh, movie. Uh, it's called in Portuguese "Lixo Extraordinário." I don't know the translation. Maybe "Extraordinary Waste." I don't know and others and others. So I think it's time to, you know, to broaden this debate 
uh, to take all these uh, these questions that we are grateful to to you uh, that uh, you know wrote uh, drop a line a, a comment here and that that is you know something that we have to go back to follow the links that you shared to us and uh, to keep talking Hmm. My collaboration is from education. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I, I, I guess the point that I was trying to make about waste to energy is not that it's wrong, not that it's bad. Uh, it's more that when you look at the real world of the developing city, where you're often only collecting 50% of the waste anyway, um, and you throw in a, a big machine, which uh, experts need to run and experts need to manage and you don't necessarily have even collection sorted out. Um, to me it's uh, a, a bridge too far quite often you know <laughs> it works in Sweden I can't I can't uh, ah, so uh, <laughs> the, the issue the issue really is that um, uh, you know when you look at a lot of the developing world that I've seen you you're seeing rivers of plastic you're seeing uh, things that uh, where where collection is not happening, and uh, the 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 issue in a way is um, how do we how do we um, help these poor people who find themselves involved in waste in in ways that can uh, bring them uh, into perhaps better alignment with government policy and also with business. Yes. Yep. Yes. Because, uh, That's because the point. That's the point. The point is policy and how, what is our perception, I mean, society's perception of, of waste. How society understands the importance of waste picking to the ecological health of the city. In cities where, uh, I mean, sanitary infrastructure are not in full capacity. Uh, in cities where rivers are almost dead, so, you know, it's a matter of priority, uh, political priority. Exactly. Exactly. And we, ha we have to, to, to work together. Uh, it, uh, you know, it's a participatory, uh, you know, dialogue and building process. It's, it's hard. We need, we need time. We need to be tolerant, uh, you know, and... Uh, to talk and step by step to build that uh, possible hmm. policy. Yeah, no, thank you for that, yes. Um, I wanted to ask you about this, um, <laughs> this book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you, you got a very impressive collection of designers, economists, engineers, all working together on uh, this wonderful idea that the energy, the, the talent, the uh, skill and the activities of waste pickers could be aligned with design in some way. And I wanted, uh, you know, you work in a school of design. Perhaps you could perhaps talk a little bit about that because I think a lot of uh, hearers would be interested in that, a lot of the participants. <laughs> so Rob, uh, thank you for showing the book. The, actually, the book is free, uh, download. Uh, I have this, uh, this paper copy, but of course uh, uh, the book is free. Uh, that book uh, uh, is a research that was support, supported by the National Council of uh, Research. It's uh, called the CNPQ. Uh, and uh, we published the book, we, we, we did the research, uh, we integrated a, a, a number uh, of uh, scholars and professors from different uh, universities across the world. And we have here the book uh, from different, from interdisciplinary perspectives. And of course, from design perspective, uh, it's uh, still a debate that we are, uh, you know, uh, improving inside the university because design is a field very connected to luxury products and furniture uh, that, that's a field of design but of as well as uh, waste is a field for design because uh, designers they they need to consider 
uh, uh, their products from the perspective of circular economy in fashion, in, uh, in technological for IT uh, design, you know, uh, the, all, all these, all the areas where designers uh, uh, design and work or, or all sectors, uh, they need to consider, you know, the, the, the post-consumption uh, point. And, uh, and uh, uh, that's this book about, and uh, you can download for free at, uh, at the, the, the website from uh, the, the research. Uh, it's uh, www.usp.residuals, uh, and then you can get the uh, download uh, for free the book. Uh, uh, we, can, that, we, can put it up. we can put it on the website. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. After I can send it to 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 yeah. Sveta, yeah. Uh, that uh, kindly organized uh, this conversation, and, uh, and I can put uh, some reference and share. I wish I could share all my students' work. Uh, I, I I I I to show to you because uh, you know they are so creative. They are working in the transformation of waste. I sent to you, Rob, a couple of days ago, one photo yes. Yes. from a last work uh, done by my student, uh, Stephanie, uh, working on plastic bags. It's so amazing, you know? No, it's great. And it's it's really the best really output that uh, I, I could show to you. Uh, it's a, a, a very small contribution. But there is, there is, you know, uh, impetus. There is heart in each one of these projects. So it's very interesting because now I've seen a number of exhibitions of student work in this field. And uh, what becomes really apparent to me is that, uh, as the circular economy theory says, waste is a resource. It is, it is a misallocated resource. And... Uh, through design, we can upcycle this material into new value, new life. Um, and in doing so, and this is the point that Franz makes, that uh, um, waste pickers care for resources and thus also for reducing emissions. Is this not highly important for communities and the human family? Should there be greater efforts, local, regional, global, to account for the, this effort and contr contribution and to align waste pickers better with policies. And I think really oh, that's yeah, thank all right. you. <laughs> everything we've been trying to say. So thank you, Franz. <laughs> thank um, you, Franz. That's great. That's absolutely true. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you are writing from, uh, from Germany. Uh, you have a German name, Gassner, but that's the point. Thank you so much. Yeah. No, I agree. I, I agree totally. And I think uh, the world is already full. Uh, this is the title of a book that Cecilia <laughs> and I are working on, so, uh, <laughs> uh, which I hope will be out later next year. But, um, you know. And also, is... and also, and also, we have an exhibition that we intend to put together uh, yes. to share with you. And uh, yes. right. <laughs> we hope next year, by this time, we could be here uh, together with Sveta and uh, sh uh, sharing the book and sharing the exhibition. That would be very good. That would be very good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I guess um, uh, in terms of the role of design, uh, one of the, you know, we, we live in a world of a linear economy, right? where we make things very, very quickly and cheaply, we use them and then we trash them. Um, uh, one of the problems is that all the rules, all the professional training, uh, all the businesses are based on models that are essentially linear. And so when we talk about the circular economy, we're not just talking about an idea, but a revolution, a complete revolution in terms of managing products, making products, designing products, thinking about products. And this is often something that 
I struggle with in my design school. I don't know if this is something you find hard as well, but a lot of professional people don't really get this. They think uh, the circular economy is just tinkering at the edges. You know, we'd make a few changes here and Rolls Royce <laughs> will redo their engines and then everything's fine. It doesn't really work like that, does it, Cecilia? Would you like to make a few? Uh, Rob, I, 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 I really, as I mentioned, uh, this, uh, this final project of uh, the engineering school, the first one, right now I forgot his name. Um, oh, his name is Hena. So, uh, uh, we, we, we spoke a lot uh, through he, the comment of his, his final project uh, uh, about a uh, waste management uh, central inside campus. How difficult it is for us, profess design and architecture professors, to think about circular economy in our pedagogical, pedagogical practice every day. Because the students, they have to build uh, models themselves. You know? yeah. So uh, the, the amount of material of a paper that they, they use every day to make little models, different models for one project, we need to think a circular economy from our, our pedagogical practice every day. You know, go to go to, to, to fashion school is the same. Go to yeah. theater school to customs uh, design, for example, is the same. So why we could not have, you know, a central point of sharing materials inside the campus of universities? Because this material uh, is it, extremely expensive for students to buy. And if, if we could reuse among us, you know, these materials in safe conditions under, under sanitary control, that would be great. You know, yeah. we would yeah. reduce, yeah. how to reduce in our pedagogical practice, how in our pedagogical practice to go to, to the same way that Duncan went in his campus in the United Kingdom. That's yeah. tricky. <laughs> yeah. oh. Thank you so much, Cecilia. Thank you for your time. Uh, we really, uh, I'm, I hope I speak for everyone to say we've really enjoyed this conversation. And, um, uh, and I hope, um, and I'm really sorry John could not uh, join us, but I'm, I'm hoping next time, uh, next time we speak, we'll be able to have John uh, from the ground, as it were, um, working and living amongst uh, waste pickers in Indonesia. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, so uh, thank you, Isbeta. <laughs> thank you, Rob. Thank you to the audience. I love the being with you and count yeah. on me. And uh, we uh, will uh, upload some material at yeah. uh, this, no, the right. website. Take care. Yeah. And, and, and uh, good holidays. Happy holidays to all yeah. of you. <laughs> Thank, you so Thank you, Cecilia. Thank you, Robert. I, I, I think I can uh, add that Cecilia did bring in a lot of energy to today's uh, panel. That was really great. And not just that, I mean, Thank you to the attendees as well. You had quite a vibrant discussion. There was a lot of information that uh, you guys shared as well. And uh, we will be putting this panel up on our website in a couple of weeks. Uh, and uh, we will also add the links that uh, Robert and Cecilia will be sharing with us and it will be up on our website for all of you to access. Uh, before we go off for our holidays, we have one more panel which is going to happen next week. Adam Reed is going to moderate that panel. It is on chemical recycling actually. So uh, we hope that you register for it and we will see you next week. So thank you once again, Robert and Cecilia. So we will end this webinar now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.